Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. So here I am on Eaton Square in London, and the house behind me was where um, Stanley Baldwin lived for many years. So Stanley Baldwin um, was Prime Minister uh, twice, 1924 to 1929, and again, 1935 to 1937. Uh, he was born in the West Midlands of England in 1867 uh, into a prominent uh, aristocratic family. They didn't, he didn't actually have a title, but they were more distantly related to noble families. So um, his uh, Christian name, Stanley, hadn't been used as a Christian name until a few decades prior to his birth. It was the surname of the Earls of Derby, a very prominent uh, English Midlands uh, noble family who'd been well known since uh, the Battle of Bosworth, 1485. Anyway, um, Stanley Baldwin, his family had um, moved into trade a bit, which was not seen as the done thing uh, by uh, the aristocracy at the time, and uh, made their uh, fortune um, in industry, really. Um, Stanley Baldwin, he went to Harrow School, so it was a duopoly of schools for the upper class. It was Eton and Oxford were the two. It was to go to one of the two was it. You were made for life, really, if you'd done that. Of course, if you even got in there, that meant that you were either very wealthy or else very brainy. Um, he was more brainy than wealthy. Certainly no, no slouch intellectually, but he wasn't stellar either. And th then he went on to Cambridge University. If I've got it right, it's Trinity, which was the college to go to. Uh, he was also the first cousin of Rudyard Kipling, that a renowned bard of empire. And Rudyard Kipling was born in India, um, was uh, almost the same age, and uh, expressed how he coveted his cousin's education because Rudyard Kipling went to a school of no great distinction and for him tertiary education was simply out of the question. Um, so uh, Baldwin, he got into uh, conservative politics and was elected to parliament at an early age and was a fairly conventional conservative, um, doing nothing to rock the boat, just wanting to rise up the ranks. So uh, it was competent in everything he did, but he wasn't renowned as a, as a, as a public speaker or as a policy wonk or anything like that. Um, Anyway, so he supported the uh, fighting the, the First World War, and again, he's perhaps he's fortunate to be considered too old to be expected to serve uh, in the armed forces. Uh, one of his uh, sons did, and later became a Labour MP. But despite this, um, Stanley Baldwin and his son always maintained a very cordial relationship. He respected his son, had simply a uh, difference of opinion on political matters, and there was no animus between them despite that. But uh, his son didn't get too far in the Labour Party. Um, anyway, so um, next step, uh, the um, Labour Party after the First World War had become the second biggest party. Um, they had, in 1922, they'd overtaken the uh, Labour Party that became the official opposition. And indeed, in 1923, they formed the government. But Ramsay MacDonald, as Prime Minister, he only managed to hang on for 10 months uh, in his minority government, and then an election was forced. Um, so uh, Stanley Baldwin then became Prime Minister in 1924, having won an election. His policy was safety first, that was, that was his motto. So, and trying to revive the sluggish economy, should they go back in the gold standard, he appointed Winston Churchill Chancellor of the Exchequer. When, when Churchill heard that he was gonna be made Chancellor, he thought, what, of the Duchy of Lancaster, of the Duchy of Cornwall? These are more or less sinecures within the cabinet, but no, Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's finance minister in most countries. So Churchill took soundings, should the United Kingdom go back on the gold standard? So from, ooh, well, the, the 19th century, you could go into a bank with your pound note uh, and get and get an uh, amount of gold that was worth, or they'd go in with gold and get and get cash. So it was backed by gold. People had confidence in the currency that it had real value because when we first started printing money, paper money in this part of the world, uh, people didn't really trust paper money, wouldn't often take it at face value. But the gold standard meant that it would never really lose value, that never be hyperinflation. Um, the United Kingdom and other countries went off the gold standard in the First World War because um, they were in financially straitened circumstances and there was this heated debate, should the UK go back on the gold standard? Churchill was minded to be against, but city opinion said that was the thing to do. Churchill went with the conventional wisdom, turned to be a mistake, probably the pound was valued too high, exports were too expensive, and unemployment remained stubbornly high. And obviously, Stanley Ball has got to carry the can for that as well. So unemployment never fell below 10%. It was the slump. Um, so the Roaring Twenties of the Jazz Age wasn't as jazzy here as it was in the United States. Um, so uh, he was very much a pragmatic conservative, um, Baldwin, and he thought it was expedient to make concessions to Indian nationalism, which was gathering pace at the time. 
Uh, he also operated on a 10-year rule, under the assumption there'd be no major war for 10 years. So there were swinging cuts to the defence budget. Um, other things that happened under his prime ministership is um, uh, women got the vote on an equal basis to men. Remember April 1918, the Representation of the People Act, uh, women gained the right to vote, but only at the age of 30. Um, and only if they were um, uh, married to a man on the electoral register or else, sorry, on the local government electoral register or else they were on it themselves, as in they were householders. But then, um, 1929, women got the vote on an equal footing with men at the age of 21, with no further restrictions. But uh, he, he lost the election uh, then to uh, the Labour Party. So uh, that was that. Um, then came the Great Depression, and Ramsay MacDonald's Labour government decided that they needed to, to cut certain things like um, welfare payments. And this was simply unacceptable to the majority of Labour MPs who did not come into politics to make life worse for the poorest in society. Uh, but Ramsay MacDonald saw no other way, and as the majority of his party wouldn't back him, he had to go to the Conservatives and he formed the National Government. So a handful of Labour MPs were National Labour, and then there was the Conservative Party, almost all of whom backed the National Government. There were some National Liberals who supported it, and then there were some other Liberals who did not, um, uh, who were the, oh my goodness, not the Simonite Liberals, the other one, the Samuelite Liberals who were against them. So that was that. So it was a mainly conservative um, government uh, led by a Labour Prime Minister. How bra pragmatic the Tories were. Back in the First World War, there had been a mainly uh, conservative government led by a Liberal Prime Minister, Lloyd George, well, from December 1916 onwards. So, um, so at this point, uh, Stanley Baldwin, who's still leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, but he consented to serve under a Labour person to represent uh, the unity of the nation. Um, although this national government, about eight out of ten of its members of parliament, were conservatives. A few liberals and a few Labour guys, but the bulk of the Labour Party and about half the Liberal Party were outside of it, as well as a handful of conservatives didn't support it. Complicated, I know. So the 1935 election, and um, that was all over. The UK had weathered the storm from the, from the Great Depression. Yes, unemployment was still high, but the United Kingdom was over the worst of it. So Ramsay MacDonald stood down. Um, he is still a, a hate figure for many in the Labour Party. And people felt that he'd been seduced, not just figuratively, figuratively but literally, by the, um, by the establishment. And indeed, he was having a torrid affair with the Duchess, to whom he wrote pornographic letters. And people were very worried this is going to fall into the hands of blackmailers. So Stanley Baldwin came back in, a reassuringly a grandfatherly figure, but uh, he was never going to set the world ablaze. And, um, and then the, the, the big thing that came up for him was January 1936, King George V passed away. He died. So the crown did solely and rightfully pass to his son Edward VIII. So Edward VIII became king and they were trying to organise the coronation. Well, there had to be a decent interval for mourning. Moreover, if the king dies in January, there's just not really not time to organise it that summer. It was going to have to be the summer of 1937. But um, there had been um, rumours on the cocktail party circuit that the king was um, stepping out with um, an American lady, Mrs. Wallace Simpson. She was still married to her second husband. Yes, she'd been divorced before, and then she was in the proceedings of a second divorce. Now, divorce was highly unusual at the time and, and extraordinarily controversial. Uh, so um, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. And um, uh, Stanley Baldwin said, I wouldn't mind if she was a respectable whore if he was to see her twice a week in the afternoon. Um, so she was simply um, not marriage material. And Edward VIII flaunted her. And that, cr that summer of 1936, he went on a cruise with her through the Mediterranean. Now, the, uh, the Fleet Street newspapers, they all got together and the editors and proprietors agreed, we will not print a word of this because uh, we're just not going to do anything which would uh, drag the royal family's name through the mud, even if we're telling the absolute truth, because uh, the press was very deferential to the media in those days, and the BBC likewise didn't breathe a word of it. But uh, the French and American newspapers uh, were not so constrained, and of course some of these newspapers were brought into this country, there was no law against that, there was no Les Majestés law, and uh, Britons went abroad and read this, so um, the rumours became more and more widely noised. So uh, this came to the abdication crisis, could he marry her or not? And it was all out in the open um, by uh, November 1936. It couldn't, it couldn't be contained. What were they going to do? And another thing is um, the government took the extraordinary step of, of not showing certain sensitive papers to Edward VII, sorry, Edward VII, because they um, believed, Edward VIII, what am I talking about? To Edward VIII, uh, they believed that he might be passing them to the Germans. They suspected he had had Nazi sympathies. Indeed, he encouraged his, his niece Elizabeth to do, to do the Heil Hitler salute. He didn't like slipshod democracies like France and the United Kingdom. He disliked um, progressive politics. Um, 
As Prince of Wales, he'd said that something must be done about mass unemployment um, in Wales and elsewhere and authoritarianism really seemed to be the way forward for him. He desperately wanted to avoid another war and suggested that if a declaration of war were given to him to sign, he would simply refuse to sign it because he was not going to put through his people through a bloodbath like a world war again. So what were they going to do? Um, should, could he marry her or not? A divorcee, the Church of England did not marry divorced people. Remember, he was, Edward the, the um, Eighth was, of course, head of the Church of England, uh, ex officio. But he's been setting some sort of moral example, and here he was committing adultery, wanted to marry her now that she's divorced. Could they, could they deport the Simpsons? They couldn't. They found out that Mrs. Simpson's um, husband, uh, he had been in the British Army in the, in the First World War, he'd been naturalised. The divorce was through, I think they still couldn't, they still couldn't legally deport her. So that was that. There was such a hoo-ha here, she spent some of her time in France. But anyway, he was absolutely determined to get married to her. So um, Churchill was one of the few people who was um, on the king's side saying, let him marry this ordinary woman. There was another thing. Was she capable of having children? She'd been twice married and, so far as we know, never become pregnant. Um, and she was almost 40, would have been the oldest royal bride ever. Um, so finally it's decided this was just not going to wash and um, the Archbishop of Canterbury tried to assure the king there'd be civil war if this went ahead. They contacted the heads of the dominions like Australia, New Zealand, Newfoundland, South Africa, um, uh, Canada and the Irish Free State. And um, it was not quite as clear cut as people pretend that all the dominions were against. Actually, the Irish Free State, de Valera said, um, we're neutral on this matter. Any, any action which disgraced uh, the British Royal House was obviously good news in De Valera's view. On the other hand, he didn't want to, seem to be seen to be condoning divorce, which he considered the height of immorality. Anyhow, um, on the 10th of December, 1936, Edward VIII bowed to the inevitable, and um, he said uh, he made a radio broadcast saying um, that he could not uh, bear the heavy burden of kingship without the support of the woman I love. I mean, uh, kingship was not that heavy a burden considering many people were living in poverty at the time. Um, so he was not unwilling to simply keep her as, a, as his mistress, and that was that. So he set forth the instrument of abdication by his own hand and handed it over to his next brother down, who was George VI. George VI, um, who was always known as um, Albert within the family, but reigned as George. Edward VIII was always known as, as um, David within his family, but reigned as Edward VIII. Anyway, so Edward VIII went off to France. He assumed the title Duke of Windsor. He invented the double Windsor knot. I shan't go through his life story. So. Um, it had taken a consummate statesman to handle this very delicate situation. That was Stanley Baldwin. And some people uh, protested in, fr in favor of Edward VIII. Um, some people, uh, what do they call themselves? I can't remember. It wasn't Edwardian, something like that. Um, uh, and uh, Pete, the children sang that Christmas, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, um, Mrs. Uh, Simpson Pinch the King, as in Wallace Simpson. So uh, he rarely came back to this country, Edward the Edward the Eighth. So in 1937, there was that coronation that May George the Sixth was was crowned in place of his brother. A lot of con coronation china had been made with Edward the Eighth's face on it, um, and obviously that was wrong. They had to redo it for um, uh, George the Sixth. But Edward the Eighth china was quite rare as a bit of a collector's item. So he was king for the moment his father died. The coronation is not necessary, but it's just an extra. Um, and then after that, uh, Sally Baldwin decided it was time to retire. Moreover, um, his health was failing. So um, in the war, they removed railings and gates from, from stately homes and melted them down because the country needed all the metal it could get. Now, if, if somebody's uh, gate was of exceptional artistic uh, merit, they could apply for an exemption. And indeed, he succeeded in getting one, which uh, resulted in a lot of um, uh, hostile commentary in the press. He was blind towards the end of his life. and. Uh, when he appeared in public in the last year of his life, the crowd were shouting loudly and he asked his son whether they were booing him because he was almost deaf by that stage as well. But anyway, he died in uh, 1947. So a uh, prime minister who's, who's not very well known, but um, whose political career spanned many a decade. Remember, he was a leader of the Conservative Party for 13 years, but only, only um, prime minister for half of them. So uh, that is uh, Stanley Baldwin.